Well, hello guys. Hope everyone is doing well today. Welcome back to my YouTube channel for another audio. My name is Ryan Provost. Today I have an interview with Michael Bradley that I will be sharing with you guys. Michael Bradley answered a couple of questions that I had for him concerning the church today being legit, uh, grafted in Gentiles, the practice of baptism being irrelevant, as well perhaps one of my favorites, who is this Satan that we read about in the New Testament? Lastly, I asked him what was his overall goal in sharing this message concerning I.O. and does he believe it is making a positive impact with those he's sharing it with. So all these questions will be answered by Michael Bradley. Hope you guys enjoyed this conversation. And without further ado, here is Michael Bradley. All right, Michael Bradley. Hey, Ryan. How you doing, Michael Bradley? Good. It's good. Good to talk with you. Good to be here. And uh, I really enjoyed your your uh, your show in uh, other uh, episodes. And uh, I really appreciate and value your input on our uh, Facebook discussions that we sometimes uh, work together on. I appreciate that. I gained a lot of insight from you from you as well. I uh, appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, why don't you tell the people a little bit about yourself and like your journey into preterism and just where it has taken you so far? Well, I'll try and be brief, but um, not too brief. I was a so-called born-again Christian for over 20 years, about 25 years. I was a holiness believer and a street preacher. I believed I was filled with the Spirit that I was saved from sin and hell. I had given a lot of money to the poor, assisted different churches financially, and had even been jailed for preaching openly in uh, Southeast Asia. I think that was back in wow. 2015. Um, I was seeking to be, you know, as apostolic as possible in my lifestyle and beliefs, mm -hmm. and uh, trying to live, trying to live in a way that if Jesus were to return that very day, you know, he would find me to be righteous and acceptable. So I was, by many people's estimation, a true believer, um, willing to sacrifice all and be found righteous when the call came to be raptured from the earth. So during this time, I was a futurist. As a futurist, I believed that Jesus would return soon and rescue Israel from its hostile Muslim neighbors and a soon-to-be-revealed Islamic Antichrist. That's mm -hmm. the view that I had as a, as a futurist. And for several years, I had been writing a verse-by-verse -verse commentary on the revelation from this futurist Islamic perspective when, in the course of my studies, I ran across much stronger evidence for the preterist view. And it began when I stumbled upon what's called AD 30 preterism. Some people might call it AD 70 preterism. Um, it shows that Jesus' death and the destruction of Jerusalem were the fulfillment of Daniel 9, uh, 24 through 27, mm -hmm. and the culmination of the 70 weeks. So not every preterist agrees with this, but that's just where I was at at the time. As I got farther into my own studies, I noticed that I had to invent concepts and ideas to fill in gaps. And basically, I was creating a narrative that fit. And I realized that this was not actual exegesis, but it was eisegesis, a bad habit right. I had always argued against 
with others, but was now doing myself. Mm -hmm. And that was just, that was intolerable, you know, to me. So I had to reassess that. And um, I, I ran across more evidence for the preterist view. And this time it was time statements and audience relevance in the scriptures. And um, that's uh, a first century return of Jesus in judgment was appearing more and more uh, to be the orthodox view for the disciples and historical accounts from the first century record events that were consistent with what Jesus told his disciples would happen in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. So all, right. from all the information that I had gotten up to that point, it was looking pretty good for preterism. The personally and intellectually honest thing to do was to reassess my commitment to the futurist view in light of the evidence for preterism. Now, based on the scriptural and historical evidence, I had to depart from uh, from futurism. Right. Uh, un unwilling to let go of some doctrinal positions and still new to the preterist paradigm, I tentatively adopted a partial preterist view but that didn't last long it, that lasted about two weeks when two after weeks? uh yeah i was a partial preterist for about two weeks and then uh after more study and um i i abandoned partial preterism for full for uh full preterism there's just no way i could continue as a partial preterist the evidence was just so great for the full position so right. After 400, after 400 pages of what was going to be a 1,200-page commentary on the Revelation, I had to abandon the project, and I began using many of my study notes to advance uh, what I considered the more orthodox and reasonable uh, full preterist view. But it didn't end there. My understanding of preterism was very superficial. I, I had not yet discovered who Jesus' return really involved and what its implications were right over time i noticed that i had always gone by faith and that i'd always just believed what pastors and academics had told me and i never really tested it in uh 2015 i think it was i i began a um, a long process of research and testing of core uh, fundamentals um, among other things, I discovered that hell, Gehenna, was never a spiritual place of unending fiery torment, but was rather the Valley of Hinnom located just outside of Jerusalem. And that was really one of the first things that kind of set me on the road to deconstructing my Christian faith. I also discovered that Satan was never a fallen angel boogeyman roaming around uh, seeking to influence me to use a translation other than the King James or to watch a rated R movie or, or whatever. Right. Yeah. Um, so that was, uh, that was a uh, pretty exciting, I mean, for me at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and Tell me uh, something. It's pretty, um, yeah. What? Uh, when you, when you realized that hell was a valley outside of Jerusalem, did that kind of help you in exploring like more into preterism and different things that you possibly wouldn't have looked at before? Yes, it did. Yeah, I think that that was. I was kind of uh, getting into preterism about the same time that I was learning about uh, the, the real truth about Gehenna. And okay. I think it, it just kind of like it was like icing on the cake. You know, it was just kind of topped everything off for me. Gotcha. Now, toward the end <clears throat> of my Christian faith, I ran into uh, Jason DaCosta in a Facebook discussion. And for several days, I challenged some of his claims. Right. I tried what I thought were my best counter arguments to try to explain away some of the things he had been sharing about. 
but I had to admit I couldn't beat his arguments. And I realized that the honest and consistent scriptural position was that Jesus didn't come to save me and that I simply didn't belong anywhere in the Bible's uh, redemptive narrative. Mm -hmm. I, I remember that uh, I was in shock for probably the first two weeks, um, just nearly traumatized by the thought that all that I had believed in was based on false premises. Yeah. That I had essentially been been living a lie. It was very shocking. It was just disturbing. Uh, mm. But it didn't take long after that, though, for me to uh, decide to let it go. And to let go of the religious dogmatism and just go where the evidence best pointed. Come away. And uh, and then to do uh, to research it further and try to make sense of life from outside of a Christian worldview. So that was it. I, I got out of the post 80, 70 Christian error altogether. And uh, I have no regrets. I discovered that I could love people more, you know, without seeing them through the lens of somebody else's 2000 year old male. Yeah. And I've accept I've accepted that I don't need to know what happens after my last breath, if anything. And I've saved a ton of money since I switched to IO. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I've yeah. saved a lot of money as well switching to IO. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I believe other people can too. And, you know, I think uh, those of us who are pretty active in sharing about Covenant IO, at least, or IO in general, um, I think that's a prime motivation is to just help people be uh, set free from religious delusion and maybe yes. save them some money, too. Yeah, that's the uh, main goal I know for myself and and uh, just trying to help people see that they're not a part of that narrative. Because you have you come across a lot of people and they feel like, you know, they're sinners. They're going to be judged one day. And then, of course, you come and bring this message to them. Some of them reject it, of course, but then you have some that are honest with themselves and they'll accept it. And sometimes it just takes time. But eventually they they accept it and they're like, wow, this is this is pretty cool. How did I miss this? Yeah, it's uh, I think for most people, it, it's going to take a long time that religious dogmatism is very that, that religious tradition is very difficult to overcome. Yeah. And uh, and also the uh, the cognitive dissonance that seems to come with, you know, a realization that you're wrong about something, especially something where you've really invested so much either emotionally or or you've invested a lot of your personal identity into what you believed. And, you know, and to admit that you've been wrong and to alter your your beliefs uh, according to what you've recently discovered that that can be very difficult and traumatizing to for, for people it's a lot of deconstructing a lot of uh relearning and letting go of certain things it, it can be difficult it was difficult for me for a little bit um until i finally accepted it which i went through that same shock that you had mm -hmm. as well <laughs> mm -hmm. i had that moment i was like wow this is you know my entire life has been based on a lie I, I got angry. I was like, man, I really wanted that hope of resurrection, life beyond death, guaranteed from Jesus. And uh, of course, you know, when you get into IO and you start seeing the promises pertain to Israel, the covenants and, you know, all those things, they had no relevance for people outside of the uh, Bible and outside of that narrative. And so when I finally accepted that, you know, like I said, I had that little tough time, but eventually I got over it. But it's a very liberating feeling, and especially when you're being honest with yourself, it it changes your perspective on life almost. It makes you value it more. Yeah, but um, I want I had a couple of questions I wanted to ask you. I had seen you have placed a bunch of articles, and you do a well job of explaining, uh, you know, why you feel certain things, certain way about certain things, and one of your article said that the church today, that no one today was the church. So I want to ask you why the church today is not legit. Well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, 
my view on that is uh, today's so-called church, uh, it's just evolved into something that's so different from the pre-AD 70 church that, you know, I think it should not even be called Christian anymore. Personally, I believe today's Christianity will eventually fizzle out on its own. Um, I believe more people will see how different it is from the pre-AD 70 church and you know, eventually they're going to realize they're they're basically being conned. But um, aside from that, I, I think today's so-called church isn't legitimate for uh, many reasons. Uh, for example, the authentic pre-AD 70 church consisted of people who had at one time been under the law. Right. Which was only Israelites. But today, you know, nobody is under the law of Israel's God. Uh, second, uh, only the pre-AD 70 church needed salvation and redemption, not people today. Today, people read themselves into the Bible's redemptive narrative. They pretend to be broken, terrible sinners in need of salvation and redemption. And then they turn to somebody else's savior to get them in, into heaven. Right. And yeah. uh, I think that's pretty pathetic. Um, According to the text, only descendants of the tribes of Israel were given the Holy Spirit, and its function on earth ended in AD 70. Today, Christians claim to have the Holy Spirit, but they don't demonstrate the evidence of it the way a first century Israelite demonstrated it, which means they aren't demonstrating it at all. Right. Um, the knowledge of the pre AD 70 church was far greater and more accurate than today's so-called church, which is in large part managed and manipulated by people pretending to be pastors, who in many instances profit financially from this arrangement. Another reason uh, the church is illegitimate is that the character of the pre-AD 70 church was far more benevolent than today's so-called church. Early Israelite believers gave their belongings to others, believing the end was near, and they loved others like there was no tomorrow, literally. Right. Today's, yeah. today's so called Christians accumulate cars and houses and other belongings, and they only give what they can afford to let go of. So it's just a very different, this idea of how to love other people is radically different uh, today than what it was in the first century. Um, another re reason is uh, the mission of evangelism in the pre-AD 70 authentic church was directed to the correct people at the right time, to Jews and other descendants of the tribes of Israel before the end of the age. Today's mm -hmm. evangelism is to the wrong people and 2,000 years uh, too late. Um, some other differences between the uh, authentic pre-AD 70 church and the faux church that followed after AD 70, the scriptures show that the pre-AD 70 gospel was a homologous uniform message for Old Covenant Israel. The gospel directed to Israel was that through Christ, salvation and redemption from the law, from the wrath of God, from their enemies, and from sin itself was available to them and that the kingdom would be restored. Mm -hmm. In contrast, today's post-AD 70 gospel has no mention of Israel, and um, there is no homologous uniform doctrine or mission to reach Jews and the elect diaspora. Now, I've also gone through nearly all of what are considered Christian writings from between AD 70 and AD 105. I still have more work to do on this. Um, and I need, I need to spend more time on it. But from what I found so far is there is little to no emphasis on salvation and redemption during that time period between AD 70 and AD 105, unless it is by a writer who wasn't aware that Jesus had already returned. Wow. So that's, uh, to me, that's very interesting. I'd like to pursue that some more. I'd like to study that some more kind of flush that out a little bit yeah um, michael green uh, the author of michael green he's a historian he outlines in his book evangelism in the first century century 
that the emphasis of the gospel immediately following AD 70 was that through faith in Jesus, one could live a new, better life. But this is very different from the pre-AD 70 gospel. So even other historians can recognize that the nature of the gospel changed from pre AD 70 to post AD 70. I find this very interesting and uh, I'd like to do more research on it. The, uh, the pre AD 70 uh, church was in one accord in its infancy. And we see this in, like in, in Acts, Acts 2, verse 1, mm-hmm. Acts 2, verse 46. And even as late as Acts chapter 15, we see, which is over 10 years after the day of Pentecost, the disciples' mission was to preach the gospel to Jews and seek out the elect diaspora from the nations to get all who were called of that generation sealed for the day of redemption so that the fullness of Gentiles would come in, the complete number, And as Paul said, so that all Israel would be saved. Their mission was accomplished in as few as 24 years. Paul wrote in his Roman epistle around AD 57, he says, their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the end of the world. That's Romans uh, 10 verse 18. Mm -hmm. So all who were meant to hear the gospel had already heard it. In contrast... In contrast to the pre-AD 70 church, the post-AD 70 so-called church, the faux church, was not in one accord. It was a sea of constantly evolving, changing, and debated doctrines and practices based on various oral traditions and many different texts, only a few of which we find in the New Testament. During the first years after AD 70, there were many gospels being circulated along with those of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It was an eschatological, soteriological, and Christological conundrum on par with today's denominationalism. Uh, We see texts like the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Truth, the Secret Book of James, the Gospel of Mary, and the Gospel of Philip were considered true by many of the post-80-70 Christians, but of course are not considered true today. Right. Um, So apparently... So apparently, you know, Israel's redemptive narrative was either forgotten or unknown by many within a generation after AD 70 and quickly replaced with a new narrative that borrowed from Old Covenant Israel's texts and was developed by people far removed from the exclusively Hebrew cultural and religious milieu that Israel's redemptive narrative came from. So these uh, reasons, for these reasons uh, and more, I don't consider today's uh, church to be legitimate. Well, there's a couple of good reasons. I mean, it's a complete difference from what you see, uh, you know, prior to AD 70 and then what you see in post AD 70. And of course, I think one of the biggest, maybe the biggest nail in the coffin for the church today is the fact that the gospel mission has already fulfilled its purpose. Like you said, there they mm-hmm. came a thousand years too late. and that that verse you quoted shows that Paul pretty much felt that the gospel had been preached to everyone that needed to receive it at that time. And of course, that goes back to Jesus when he says, you know, the gospel, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all the world. Then the end would come. And we know that that end was connected with the destruction of the temple, um, his coming, the resurrection of the saints. It shows like, you know, people. You know, people living beyond that generation, they have no connection to what the Bible is pretty much showing us or telling us. They're disconnected from it. Yeah, and they try really hard to find a connection. And, you know, that's that's their motivation for for uh, reading themselves into the text and thinking that, that the text is speaking to them and and all these uh, tactics that they use to try and identify and relate to the biblical characters. And, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's delusional. It's really, it's like people are just kind of self deluding. Yeah. Picking up somebody's, I like how you say it. You say they pick up someone's 2000 years old male and begin to read themselves into it. <laughs> That's a pretty good yeah. analogy. And how many other books, how many, how many other ancient texts 
do people do that with? I don't think any. None. Yeah, they yeah. don't do that with any other book. And but even today, you, you know, you, re, you pick up a novel, you pick up some book at the bookstore. You know, how many people are going to, like, read themselves into some uh, some biography of, of a president or, or a historical uh, book about the Civil War or, uh, you know, how many people do that? Nobody does that. So right. why, why some collection of texts penned by and for Israelites that are over 2,000 years old? Why, why that book only? And it's because they have an emotional investment into that belief system. And um, it's very difficult for, uh, for people, I think, to um, get out of that because they have so much invested into their faith. That is a very good point, Michael Bradley. Now, with the whole covenant IO, y'all, you know, you take the effort to show that the gospel was only for Israelites, that Jesus only came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and that's who the new covenant was for. But what would you say to people that, you know, they say, well, obviously Paul was sent to the Gentiles, you know, so they believe that they are, they are the Gentiles that Paul was searching for. And so I would like to ask you, why are people today the Gentiles that Paul was searching for? Are spreading the gospel with? Well, uh, absolutely not. Um, there's this idea that that, um, and I hear this quite often that people say, "Well, well, the Gentiles are grafted in, so that means I guess I'm grafted in," and they think that they're some of those grafted in Gentiles, and that's just completely ridiculous. Uh, those who were grafted in were the elect diaspora, descendants of the tribe of Israel who were called out of the nation. Israel was the olive tree. So let's see who was grafted in. Romans 11 verse 17 says, but if some of the branches were broken off and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, now share in nourishing root of the olive tree. So the branches that were broken off are not other type of tree the branches when a branch breaks off of a tree it branch breaks off of that tree not some other tree so the right. branches the branches come from the same stock which was israel and jesus clearly identified who the branches were in john 15 verse 5 jesus said you are the branches so wow. who was Je so who was jesus talking to israelites that's right so nowhere in scripture is there a gathering of pagans for an end of the age judgment. There's no gathering together of pagans and Jews to be united before the day of redemption in the scriptures. And there are no pagan olive branches anywhere in scripture. It was always about the tribes of Israel being grafted in to the vine of Israel. Very good. And also, they had to be grafted in prior to Christ coming as well, correct? Uh, yes, definitely before. Mm -hmm. Right. So, it, I mean, and seeing that Christ already came, you know, we got many verses that affirm that, like Matthew 16 and 28. You know, some of you standing here will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Then, of course, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 34. You know, all those verses places his coming in that very generation. So any Gentile, even let's say, you know, they, they wanted to make the uh, try to argue that they were not Israelites, it still wouldn't matter because they would all be grafted in already. Yeah, and another uh, another line of argument that I often use is um, greatly hated, I'm sure, by full preterists and even partial preterists. Is that, you know, Paul said in Romans 11 verses 25 through 26 that the fullness or rather the complete number of Gentiles would come in. And, and he says in that way, all Israel would be saved. So mm -hmm. clearly any any Gentile who was saved was part of the all Israel that was saved. And the fact that the complete number came in uh, nearly 2000 years ago, the uh, precludes any other Gentiles coming in afterwards. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been a complete number. So, wow. um, you know, the argument yeah. that, 
that Gentiles are still coming in just falls flat on its face. That is a very good point, Michael Bradley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, either all Israel was saved at the time Christ came or they were not. And if all Israel yeah. was saved at Christ's coming, then all the Gentiles were accounted for. Yeah, all the, all the, the gospel went out to the nations and the end came. The complete number or fullness of Gentiles came in and all Israel was saved. And then where do we see them? We see them in like Revelation chapter 7. They're, that's where they're gathered together. Right. That's exactly right. And they're all sealed from the 12 tribes of Israel. That's right. Sealed, saved, reconciled, redeemed, the whole works. It only, in, it only involved Israelites. You don't see any pagans in there. It's only only Israelites. Very good point. Uh, one other question I had for you is the practice of baptism. As a Christian growing up in a Pentecostal church, I was taught that baptism was very relevant for our salvation today. Now, of course, I hold different beliefs on that. But what would you say to someone that was trying to say baptism is a relevant baptist, uh, practice for today? Well, it's, it was relevant for salvation then but if there's no need for salvation today well then there's obviously no need for baptism today right a, a little bit about baptism we see baptism we see like a type of baptism in the old testament for example when god saved his old covenant people from egypt which is often symbolic for sin and they are baptized in the red sea according to first corinthians 10 verse 2 and in moses mm -hmm who represented the law. So in the New Testament, baptism began with water. So we're going to see a transition here. In the New Testament, baptism began with water, uh, like with the ministry of John, for the remission of sins. Later, it became both baptism and spiritual baptism, or water baptism and spiritual baptism. We see that in Acts 2, verse 38. And now, 20 years later, because of the Pauline understanding of there being only one baptism, according to Ephesians 4, verse 5, of spiritual identification with Christ's work on the cross, the emphasis on baptism became exclusively spiritual by the time of the end. So even if baptism was relevant for today, those who dunk people in water are just getting them wet. They're not saving them from anything. Interesting. Um, something more about baptism. Um, baptism was was how somebody uh, became uh, in Christ. Okay. For right. example, yeah. Galatians three verse twenty seven <laughs> says, "For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ." Through being baptized in Christ, an Israelite could have redemption, and we see that in Ephesians one verse seven. It says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. So those who were baptized into Christ also in him had redemption of his blood. But we understand from verses like Hebrews 9 verse 15 that redemption was for sins done under the first covenant. Only Israelites sinned under the first covenant. Nobody today hey, needs... Nobody today needs the redemption that baptism into Christ brought to Israelites. So clearly, uh, Paul's Ephesian audience were descendants of the tribes of Israel who needed redemption. Mm -hmm. But nobody today needs redemption. So again, if you just dunk them in water, it's not going to do anything. Now, baptism was also linked to and limited to those who would hear the gospel and be saved before the time of the end. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19, he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And he uses the word, uh, well, the Greek word is ethnos for people, nations, tribes, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But we see in Matthew 14, verse 14, or 24, verse 14, Jesus said, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. So the gospel was clearly linked to baptism, which ended at the coming. Honest and consistent preterists agree 
that the coming was in AD 70, which means the end was in AD 70. And since mm. the gospel, the coming, and the end pertained exclusively to Israel, the end of the need for baptism would also seem to be in view. So those who were baptized in Christ had already been baptized into Moses. Nobody today has been baptized into Moses. Only Israelites were baptized into Moses. And when the end came, the law passed away, which means that since the time of the end, which was 8070, nobody has been baptized into Moses. Therefore, nobody has needed baptism into Christ for nearly 2,000 years. Do you follow that? I follow. That's pretty logical there. <laughs> you see the? Did you see the progression though? How I got to that end? I, I definitely did. That is. Okay. That, now, that's something pretty, else. Go ahead. Something yeah. else. Uh, G, you know, Jesus came to give repentance and forgiveness of sins to his sheep, whom the Bible right. shows were only Israelites. Washing away sins in water makes no sense for anyone other than whom he came for which according to Matthew 15, 24, was only the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And according to Galatians 4, verse 5, those under the law, which was only Israel. Collectively, both groups were sheep. They were, they were Israelites. They were lost sheep, all of them. Right. Also, it was Israel's sins that were like scarlet, but were washed away and made white as snow not pagan not the sins of pagan nations the need for baptism ended when all israel was saved sealed redeemed forgiven and washed and then the end came in first peter 4 verse 7 peter predicted the end of all things is at hand there is not a single scripture in the entire bible about an alleged need for baptism after the end which as you may recall only pertain to israel and then when we look in the Revelation, there's also uh, a distinct absence of baptism anywhere in the Revelation. Since the need for baptism ended and the people who baptism was intended for uh, perished, it, it seems to follow that nobody has been baptized into Christ for nearly 2,000 years. Uh, and therefore, nobody is in Christ today. They're, they're just, they're pretending. They're religious people dunking other people in water, being religious and just pretending. But they're really in reality, though, they, they're they not baptizing in anyone into Christ. Wow, that is beautifully put together, well connected. Tell me, are you familiar with the uh, Pentecostal church? Yeah, I used to uh, attend Pentecostal and charismatic churches. Okay, well, mm-hmm. that's my background, and if you if you know about them, you know that they're big on Jesus' name baptism. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so, so if you were to share this message with them, they would most likely throw you out the church. <laughs> yeah, they'd probably, you know, say I'm going to hell and and I'm a heretic and you know all that other love and stuff. <laughs> all all that good Christian love. It's okay. All that. Good Christian love. <laughs> you know the, so the nice me. thing. The, the nice uh, thing about are some other things that, um, but I've learned though since coming out of the uh, post AD seventy Christian eras. You know I've learned to respond to people a lot better than what I ever did as a Christian. As yeah. a Christian, I, I took things pretty personally. It was if something if something threatened my faith, I got defensive and. Um, but it seems like after after I got out and after I realized that I.O. Was, was true, it's like uh, a new sense of, of patience came on me. And, you know, I'm able to I'm able to handle people who yell at me or curse me or threaten that I'm going to go to hell and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, I kind of have fun with it, too, sometimes. But, I mean, <laughs> it might piss them off. But. Um, I just don't get affected by it as much. I, I really, I kind of feel sorry for them in a way, and I just want to, I want to keep the stress level down and the, 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 uh, and and leave the doors open for them to remember our discussion and right. maybe think of think about it some more or maybe look me up later if they have questions. So um, these days, since I came to uh, I/O, I've I've just been able to 
respond to people with more kindness, with more patience than I ever did as a Christian. That's good. That's a testimony in itself. And you're probably like one of the most vocal people out there when it comes to sharing I.O. I mean, you constantly putting out articles. Uh, people are always constantly coming at you, especially in the uh, that Calvinist group. <laughs> those guys, <laughs> I see those guys say some things about you. I'm like, man, Michael Bradley's just making a serious impact. Uh, I mean, they go from calling you Satan. They say you don't know the Bible. <laughs> and But then you have some, of course, that like they don't have arguments. They're just coming with rhetoric against you. But you do a great job, man, at sharing, you know, your beliefs, showing your understanding. I remember it was Rob Lombard. He was like, Michael Bradley gives some of the most logical, uh, uh, you know, he gives some of the most logical conclusions concerning the scriptures with his way of thinking. And I agree with them 100 percent. It's kind of hard to get around the things you present if you're going to be honest with the scriptures, in my opinion. Yeah, that's the key. And, you know, that's that's why I couldn't beat Jason DaCosta's arguments. It's because I was honest with myself, right. you know, about about it. But if a person is not going to be honest and they can make up anything they want and think that they won the argument or, or think that they're still a Christian or whatever the case is. But, you know, when I, I was honest with with uh, with myself about it and uh, and I had to go with where the evidence best pointed, you know, regardless of of uh, how it made me feel in the short term. But, you know, I got over it. I got over the cognitive dissonance. And, you know, it's it's definitely worth it. I definitely, uh, it was a sense of relief, of freedom from uh, bondage to religion. Um, it's just nice. Uh, it's nice knowing the truth. It's nice having a, a sound mind uh, without reading myself into somebody else's redemptive narrative. There's a lot of. A lot of good things, a lot of good changes have happened in my life and uh, since since I uh, discovered I.O. from uh, Jason DaCosta and Michael Beerus and, and other people. Yeah, I've seen some of the good changes. You went, actually went out to your first football game. Oh, yeah, that was and, great. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> that you celebrated a little bit of Halloween with your kids. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we had a great yes. time. It's just uh, there's a freedom... There's a real freedom in just being free from religious uh, dogma and fear from, you know, some uh, some pissed off sky daddy, you know, throwing me into some eternal hellish torment and all that just nonsense, that religious nonsense, that garbage that I picked up over the 25 years. It keeps you it almost keeps you from just enjoying life, I guess, because I did the Halloween thing as well recently with my girls and. I didn't feel guilty about it. I, and they enjoyed themselves. They was out there getting candy. It's not like they was doing something evil, but they were actually enjoying themselves and having fun. Yep. And so, you know, it creates some good memories for you down the road. Yeah, I had a great time when I was a kid at Halloween. I, I, I don't want to take that away from my kids, you know. And, and for our youngest one, you know, we explained to him that, well, you know, this is just pretend. And, you know, and kids have a pretty good imagination. They can... They can understand that and, and just roll with it and have a good time. And, and they do. Yes, sir. So one, one of the uh, last questions I have for you is concerning Satan. So who is who exactly is this Satan you read about in the New Testament? Because a lot of people have this perception of a fallen angel. Uh, they believe he's going around, you know, tempting people today. Who exactly is Satan? Well, that's a good question. Um, I don't think there's any way I can answer that with a real brief answer because there's really many facets to the whole Satan topic. Right. But I'll try and I'll try and condense it so it doesn't take too long on on your interview. Um, okay. But I'll just start off with saying that there are aspects of Satan in the New Testament that draw from and I believe are related to Satan in the Old Testament. Um, specifically, the uh, the snake in Genesis three, um, 
the devil, Satan. These are all uh, symbolic descriptions of, of people and concepts like opposition to the gospel or opposition to the church, opposition to the, to the evangelism of Paul and, and other people at the time, opposition to Yahweh himself. Um, I think it's better to to go back to the Old Testament first, mm-hmm. and because the Old Testament is where New Testament Israelites, it's where they got their imagery and their concepts from when they when they made uh, predictions and warnings of judgment and things like that. And I think right. Satan was also part of that. Now, the earliest book in the Bible is Job, and, and we see Satan mentioned there. He's only mentioned in the first two chapters. and But nowhere in the book is he explicitly defined as an angel. So one thing that we got to make clear right away is that the Bible does not support, it does not teach, it, there is just no part of the text teaches that Satan was some fallen angel character roaming around trying to influence people to sin and uh, not use the King James Version and fornicate (laughs) and, you know. So, you know, the fact that Satan is only mentioned twice in Job and that he's not defined as an angel should be a hint that that even in Job, um, Satan is not the fallen angel caricature of religious tradition. And that's pretty much what Satan has become over time is, is a religious tradition. Right. Now, interest, interestingly, Job never himself blames a spiritual being for his problems. But throughout the book, there is an underlying consideration of why God would bring such problems upon Job. Job even comments about it. He says in Job 9, verse 24, he says, if it be not he, like God, then then who is it? So even Job didn't believe anyone apart from God was responsible. Satan as a spiritual creature causing Job's suffering was simply not in view in, uh, in, in Job. Job just wasn't even thinking that way. And that's another that that's another thing is that the Old Testament people they and especially uh, Israelites they thought very differently than New Testament people um, because New Testament people were highly influenced by Greek culture which is it's logical it's linear it's, it's literal so when we read Job we need to keep that in mind that there's going to be a lot of symbolism in that text. So, oh, were you going to say something? Yeah, I was saying I never read that passage before. Uh, yeah. Because I, yeah, I, I never read that before, where Job is blaming. I understood that Job wasn't actually addressing a fallen angel, but that he was actually blaming God there, you know, asking who it was. That's mm-hmm. pretty cool. Now, the fact that Job does not blame an an evil spiritual being for his suffering suggests that at the time Job was penned, Satan was not even understood to be an evil spiritual being who inflicted harm on others. Uh, Job's friends insist that, quote, the destroyer uh, had touched Job, whereas Job insists that it was God who destroyed him. And the references for that are Job 15, 21, 19, 10, and 13, 21. So evidently, it was Job's friend Eliphaz appeal to a force of darkness in Job 22, verse 10 and 11. And sinful or faulty angels living in an unclean heaven that Job himself uh, refutes. So we also notice from Job that Satan is never rebuked, but Job's friends were rebuked so if Mm -hmm. satan was a literal spiritual being the assumed fallen angel character responsible for job's suffering 
we would expect him to be blamed. However, in the entire book of Job, Satan doesn't actually do anything evil of his own accord. He just does what God allows him to do. And so it's through this lens that we should understand Job's situation uh, not as an attack from a spiritual boogeyman, but as a predicament of and one's response to evil when it happens to a righteous person, as Job was portrayed. So it's like an allegory of evil confronting a good person. Job is not even describing a real being, but rather a personification of evil confronting good. The common interpretation, very common in the West, reflects the Greek-oriented, logical, literal interpretive paradigm, which has been wrong for centuries. Uh, this is just not an issue of literal interpretation, but it involves considering what type of literature Job is and the thought processes that would have gone on in the mind of, of Job. Uh, from an erroneous interpretation of Satan and Job, literalists have created a monster that we have believed is a fallen angel caricature of Satan, something completely different than what an ancient writer like Job was considering in the text, which was a highly allegorical example of evil confronting good. And uh, what began as a personification of evil has, through religious tradition, evolved to become a monster of superstition that has been inhabiting the collective conscience of human beings for centuries. Um, Now, another text that people will go to when they think of Satan is they go to Job 2, verse 1. Mm -hmm. And and it's about, you know, how the sons of God and Satan um, met with God. And this kind of helps to, to form that idea that Satan is a fallen angel who would later fall to earth. Because here the sons of God and Satan are meeting with God in Job 2, verse 1. Um, but the fact that Satan and the sons of God were in the presence of the Lord and presented themselves before the Lord, per what the text says, doesn't necessarily mean that they were in heaven. Good point. The, uh, the phrase sons of God can refer to those who have a true understanding of God. And we see this in Romans 8, verse 14, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 17 through 18, and 1 John 3, verse 7. And the representatives of God carry the name of God, for example, the agent that which led Israel through the wilderness was called the Lord because it carried God's name, Exodus 23, verse 20 and 21. But right. it was not but it was not God himself in person. Right. Sim similarly, uh, priests represent God, for example, in Second Chronicles 19, verse 6. And to come before them was to come before the Lord. Cain went out from the presence of the Lord in Genesis 4, verse 16, but he was not, he did not go out of heaven, but just probably away from the presence of the angel or the cherubim. Jesus that is, was good. Yeah, and Jesus was presented as a baby, quote, before the Lord in Luke 2, verse 22, but he was actually, he wasn't in heaven, he was before a priest, he was presented before a priest. So, when we read Job 2, verse 1, where it says uh, that God came to present, the sons of God came to present themselves before with the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord, we can understand that both Satan and the sons of God were human beings, likely religious priests or messengers who were meeting with another human being somewhere on earth who carried the name or represented God. Wow. So so between uh, between uh, what I presented earlier on Satan and this, you know, we, we don't find anything in Job that definitively shows that the narrative in Job beginning in heaven or began in heaven or even has anything to do with otherworldly creatures. Okay, right. so we just need to get that, that Old Testament uh, as far as... Uh, the use of Satan in, in Job uh, out of the way. 
Now, in Genesis, the words Satan, devil, demon, Lucifer, and fallen angel, they don't even occur anywhere in the book of Genesis. Um, this suggests that, that the concept of Satan being a personal evil being or a fallen angel is a later development, especially when you consider that in the oldest Old Testament book, Job, Satan is not seen as responsible for Job's suffering. So you put those two <clears throat> things together, and this suggests that Job was one thing, or Satan was one thing in the book of Job, but over the years, he kind of evolved into something else. And what we have today is the end result of that evolution of Satan, of being, uh, you know, this fallen angel boogeyman who runs around trying to tempt people to not read the NIV, to watch rated R movies, and other such things. Right. Um, and this, uh, th these transitions aren't, aren't unusual. For example, a demon exorcism was originally a Babylonian practice. Um, Satan as a fallen angel boogeyman was likely an import from pagan cultures outside of Israel. Mm -hmm. even, is, even Islam copies Christianity's errors. Uh, for example, it, it copies Christianity's erroneous interpretation of Satan. Some, <laughs> some Islamic scriptures even teach that Satan sleeps in the noses of Muslims at night. Wow. Yeah. I've well, heard it's that. pretty crazy. But, but this is just an example of how you know, ancient cultures would borrow concepts from each other. And when a concept began with one thing, let's say in Job, it would kind of build and change and evolve as it moved through different cultures. Um, throughout the Old Testament, Yahweh is presented as an all-powerful, uh, without equal and, in no, and without any competition with any angel. The Old Testament makes it clear that any adversary to God's people was ultimately the control of God himself. All angels are spoken of as being righteous servants of God, even angels of evil or disaster who brought destruction upon sinners were still God's angels carrying out his will and judgments and were considered good. So, and I personally, in, in my research on angels, I believe that they're mostly, um, they're mostly men, they're messengers, they're religious men. Um, mm -hmm. And any any reference to a non-natural being is is a uh, mythical, and probably borrowed from uh, some other culture. Now, init Israelites initially held to the view of angels being righteous human messengers, but as has uh, happened so often in many cultures, they mixed their beliefs. They mixed their beliefs with the beliefs of those who conquered them. So, what okay. began as what began as Satan being the force of an opposing will evolved to become an imaginary evil creature that has found its place in uh, in the collective conscience of religious masses in three major religions and probably other uh, cultures as well. Other religions have some kind of evil boogeyman that um, is based off of some Satan type character. Now for the New Testament. Um, wow, there's a. Uh, there's a lot about Satan in the New Testament, but it all pertains to Israel and to Israelites. There is no Satan in a vacuum in the New Testament. He just doesn't exist on his own, wandering around trying to trying to corrupt uh, non-Israelites. That, that just doesn't happen. In the New Testament, Satan is always related to Israel <clears throat> in some way. Now, when I was a Christian, there was an underlying fear of the uh, princes and powers of the air. I'm sure you've heard that. Probably. Yes. Uh, it comes from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. And to me, these were the unseen spiritual forces that sought my destruction and were always ready to trip me up, cause me to sin or to doubt my salvation. Now, to be a good soldier of Jesus, I needed to be dressed in spiritual armor and by virtue of faith conduct spiritual warfare against these demonic forces but i found out later that was quite ridiculous yeah <laughs> as a christian i believe that the prince of the power of the air 
was an evil fallen angel named Satan who somehow traveled from place to place, quite literally, through the air. And what was the and what was the spirit that is now working in the children of disobedience in uh, Ephesians 2, verse 2? Well, spirits sometimes were associated with men. For example, pertaining to false prophets, John said in 1 John 4, verse 1, do not believe every spirit, but test spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So clearly, John is equating spirits with the false prophets that need to be tested. Um, so in my opinion, a spirit working in the children of disobedience was the influence of a man, some some religious man, a false prophet. Mm -hmm. Now, in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 6, Paul said, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. So the princes there were were Old Covenant Jews. How do we know this? Because two verses later it says, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So clearly the princes of this world in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 8 is referring to Jewish leaders. Right. The word, the, and, and you know uh, that the word world, cosmos, often refers to, old, to the Old Covenant religious system Right. So <clears throat> the prince of the power of the air was a Jewish leader, uh, probably the high priest at that time. I agree so with that. That's just uh, something that um, something interesting that pertains to, you know, Satan, demons, devils. Um, another uh, common thing is uh, people seem to think, uh, especially a uh, non preterist Maybe some predators, I don't know. Uh, they seem to think that the so-called God of this world that blinded the minds of the, of the unbelieving was was that fallen angel caricature. And uh, eh, nothing could be farther uh, from that. Uh, so to find out who the God of this world was, we need to widen the text, the context a little bit. Let's go to Second Corinthians 4 verse 3. And it says, even if gospel is veiled it is veiled to those who are perishing okay well we know that the gospel was meant for israelites and who was perishing? well the unrepentant unbelieving old covenant jews second uh, thessalonians 2 verse 9 says that is with one who is coming in accord with the activity of satan with all powers signs and false wonders and with all the deception wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth to be saved so here again we see satan associated with judaism power and signs and false wonders the word world in corinthians 4 verse 4 is the greek word iron which means age and is, and is referring to the age of the old covenant religious so, so those who were believers and were perishing were jews the God of this world, therefore, was uh, Judaism. Now, some people may uh, have alternative explanations for that, and I think that's okay. I think that there's other legitimate, like some people I've heard think that the high priest was the God of this world. Um, other people I've heard consider uh, the law itself to be the God of this world. Um, but in all these cases, whether it's the old covenant religious system being the God of this world, the law or the high priest, uh, it's all uh, limited to a, an Israelite context. And I think that's the main point to get out of all this. Right. Um, the devil was also like when we talk about the devil, the devil just means false accuser. In the New Testament, Satan and the devil are closely associated with Judaism. Judaists were leading Israelites away from the gospel, and Jesus called them the sons of the evil one, the devil, and false accuser. For example, in Matthew chapter 13, it says, In the field is the world, and as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom, and the tares are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are angels. 
So Jesus is kind of giving us some definitions right there. Right. Jesus said in John 8, 44, that the devil is a liar. Then in verse 55, Jesus insinuated that those who opposed him were liars. So he says, and you have not come to know him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I will be a liar like you. So Jesus is calling them liars, but layer collectively, he's calling them Satan. Jesus also oh, called yeah. Yeah. Jesus also called Judas a devil in John 6 70. Jesus said to him, Jesus answered them, Did I myself not choose you the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? Thus, you know, the Jews opposed Jesus were devils. They weren't little red guys with pitchforks and pointy ears running around, hovering over our shoulders, encouraging us to uh, to uh, watch rated R movies. No, they were <laughs> they were people who opposed Jesus. Um, Jesus called Jews who opposed him vipers, snakes, which of course pictures Satan as a snake in Genesis three and, and Revelation twelve verse nine. Although the word Satan isn't actually mentioned in Genesis three. Matthew twenty three verse thirty. Jesus says, you serpents, you brood of vipers, how will you escape the sentence of hell? In my opinion, Jesus likely had the serpent of Jesus of Genesis 3 in mind, which was not a literal talking snake, but a snake representing a deceptive man. In Revelation 12, verse 9, it says, the serpent of old, who was also called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. So again, we see that Jews who opposed him were the devil and Satan. And in my opinion, that gives us a clue as to what or who the serpent was in the garden. When we see Jews and Judaism being associated with serpents and snakes in the New Testament, and quite often imagery from the New Testament was gotten from the Old Testament, then it seems very likely to me that serpents in Genesis 3 are also talking about a person, not a literal snake, but, but a person who is just very deceptive and has the qualities of a false accuser and an, and, and opposer of God. Right. Um, in, in the Revelation, there is Jesus reference to Jews who are not, and the synagogue of Satan in Revelation 2 verse 9. These were false Jews, Judaizers who opposed the doctrines of the first century church um, are here are closely associated with Satan. Here, Satan is just a personification of opposition of the, to the church. John 18, 29 shows that Jews were the ultimate false accusers of Jesus. Pilate went out to unto them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? So once again, this the word accusation, accuse, false accuser, Satan, devil, uh, vipers, snakes, these are all pertain to Israelites, um, never to non-Israelites. Now, the same Greek word for accuser is used to describe false accusations leveled against Paul in an attempt to hinder his work. Um, Paul spoke of Jews who hindered his evangelism in 1 Thessalonians. He says in chapter 14, even as they did from the Jews who both killed the Lord Jesus and his prophets and drove us out. They are not pleasing to God, but hostile to all men, hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. And then two verses later, Paul refers to them as Satan. He says, for we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, more than once, and yet Satan hindered us. That's pretty within clear. Two verses, yeah, within two verses, we're seeing Paul associate Satan with Jews who are hindering his uh, ministry. It's very clear. That's pretty the, clear. You can't, in the Revelation, <clears throat> yeah, you can can't get any more clear than that. And in the Revelation, um, well, this is another one that's disputed among um, 
Christians and preterists and even Iowas, I suppose. Um, I take the view that that the law was the accuser of the brethren, um, although there was probably like the high priest, scribes and other people who were busy falsely accusing the brethren wherever they went. But um, for purposes of this interview, my view is that the law was the accuser of the brethren. So in Revelation 12, verse 10, it says, For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Thus, Jews who falsely accused Jesus, those who hindered Paul, and even the law itself, was the devil and Satan. Um, so this clearly is not some spiritual boogeyman roaming around trying to devour people like a lion, but just a literary tool to symbolize the opposition that Judaists had to Jesus' gospel and the authentic uh, pre-AD 70 church. And then um, another very interesting uh, aspect of Satan, um, people like to bring up Jesus' temptation in the garden. And this is really one of my favorite teachings about Satan. Um, I won't go into detail on it. If somebody wants the whole thing, I, I can send it to them. But I just want to summarize some things. Is that Matthew 4, verse 1 begins a narrative that has Jesus walking around in a desert talking and interacting with the devil, what many people believe is a fallen angel, otherwise known as Satan. But there are good reasons to believe that the temptation of Jesus did not actually happen according to the literal view we are accustomed to, including the devil not being what we have always believed it to be. For example, Jesus was tempted while in the wilderness, but it was also clearly shown that at least one of the three temptations took place in Jerusalem, which is not in any wilderness. It yeah. also says, Matthew 4, verse 5 says, and then the devil, the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. Either there's a contradiction here, or the narrative is, an, is employing symbolic imagery with the wilderness being symbolic of its Old Testament parallel of ancient Israel's 40-year wandering in the wilderness, a time of trial and great difficulty. And this would explain why Jesus replied to the temptations by quoting from portions of Deuteronomy that were relevant to the wilderness temptations of Israel. For example, Deuteronomy 8, 3, 6, and 6, verse 16. It's also unlikely that Jesus and some invisible fallen angel climbed the side of the temple, Jesus would have been seen apparently talking to himself. That would have been noticed by the temple workers and priests and would have caused a huge scandal. No such scandal recorded in the text. And finally, there is no mountain high enough for Jesus to see all the kingdoms of the world, especially those on the other side of the globe. Flat earthers may have a different opinion on that. <laughs> um, now, these are clues that the narrative surrounding Jesus' temptations uh, should not be interpreted literally. So is there anything from the text that identifies who or what the devil is? Yes. After Jesus responded to the devil the third time with quotes from the Old Testament, Satan departed for a season. That's what the Bible says. Luke 4, verse 13. And, and when the devil had ended all the temptations, he departed from him for a season. Now, departing for a season implies that he would return in a season. We should be able to identify the devil in the wilderness by observing who returned to tempt Jesus later. And who or what was that? Well, the Jewish crowd wanted to make him king in John 6.15. Jews asked for miraculous bread. In John 6, verse 31, Jewish disciples wanted Jesus to go to Jerusalem to show his power. Um, additionally, the Jewish people, the Pharisees, and Herod demanded of Jesus that he do a miracle. So the temptations 
of Jesus were preparing him to respond to the temptation to seek a worldly kingdom, physical instead of spiritual, to be the type of Messiah the Jews were looking for, rock instead of who God intended him to be, bread from heaven, and to use his power for evil purposes, including the power to influence people to worship leaders of Judaism instead of God. So this is another example of Satan or the devil just being people, Jews who oppose Jesus, not fallen angel caricature that um, has been entertaining and terrifying people for centuries. Um, that's where I'll end on that. Other that was aspects of. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say that was really a really good breakdown from Satan from the Old Testament. That whole concept of, you know, Satan appear with, appearing in the presence of God with the other angels and you showing how that connects to, like, people that represented God on earth, it doesn't mm -hmm. require that to be a situation in heaven. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. I, I love the entire, the entire teachings of it. That is, that's pretty awesome. And it's kind of, I think it's more, it, it goes natural with the text. Rather than trying to yeah. force it to be a fallen angel. Well, if you think like a first century Israelite, then you're going to be looking for symbolism, allegory, uh, things like that. To, to trying to explain concepts and teaching. And I think that's what's going on in Matthew 4 with the temptations of Jesus in the desert. And um, it's quite clear from the scriptures to me that the three temptations were answered were seen later by exclusively Israelite people, yeah. not non not non Israelite. So the context of that is purely Israelite as well. Very very good, very good. Well, I have one last question for you, so we could end this interview and let you get on with your life again. Uh, what? Well, tell me what, what you got. Be Okay, it's what would be the overall goal of sharing this message concerning IO with people, and do you believe it's making a in a positive impact with people? Well, I think the overall goal is uh, to know the truth. Okay, and you know, quoting Jesus. The truth will set you free. Spoken to Israelites, but when we, uh, that's something that still applies to people today. And I think once people know the tr truth, that they're basically, they're ignorant, they're naive to the facts that the context of the entire Bible is Israelite, the redemptive narrative of the entire Bible concerned only Israelites. The audience relevance with Israelites in uh, scriptures pertain to salvation and redemption and reconciliation, baptism, forgiveness, judgment, all of that. And um, I value truth. You know, I value it more than than being right. If I wanted to be right, then I would have just stayed a Christian. I would have remained dogmatic. I would have ignored audience relevance, time statements. I would have uh, just buried my head in the sand pretty much and just wanted to keep things as they were, keep the status quo, keep the delusion going, keep the emotional high going. But I, I value truth more than that. And I was willing to let all of that go to find truth. And I can tell you that it's definitely worth it. Now, it's a painful process, though. Mm -hmm. And you know, we've, we've obviously made good progress on sharing about AO to a lot of people, especially in the predator community. Um, our own IO community has uh, grown pretty fast. Yep. And we have we have two uh, 
Facebook pages uh, um, at uh, Controversial Christianity. Uh, black Black Sheep is um, it's not just for IO. It's it's pretty much for everything, but it's a safe place for IOers to uh, network and to balance things off of other people. It's it's also a no censorship zone. It's pretty much the wild west of uh, preterism pages, and it's pretty cool. I I uh, encourage other people to check it out. Um, and then there's also the uh, the Covenant IO page called the Preterist Collective, um, and that's primarily for Covenant IO. And mm-hmm. of course, we we welcome uh, all people, and we we want challenges to to the view, and we also share uh, information about the view there. Um, it's not exactly the Wild West. Um, like controversial Christianity, but um, it's a it's a good place. It's a it's a place with a lot of resources, and I think the people who are there are genuinely interested in the view, and I I think they find it you know, fascinating that uh, that this is coming out. I mean, I think we're living in a special time where where uh, this truth can can be known to people, and and it can make a, a difference in people's lives. Um, I think people are more happy once they discover IO and, and accept it's true, I think their overall uh, life is, their lifestyle is better, their lives um, are more happy. I mean, they don't have to worry about some pissed off sky daddy throwing them into hell. They right. don't have to worry about doing certain uh, religious rituals, and they don't have to worry about paying some guy money to every week to uh, lie to them. So um, right. there's a lot of benefits to it. Um, I've met some really nice people to, who are IORs. And, um, but yeah, I think uh, the overall goal though is just to share the truth and to keep uh, keep learning. That's another goal. We don't uh, We don't know at all. There's a lot that I don't know. Right. And I've learned a lot from other IORs. Um, I've learned a lot from Michael Bieras, mm-hmm. uh, you, your, yourself, David King, Jason DaCosta, um, and, and other people. And uh, I'm still learning more. I, I'm, I'm excited about, you know, what's going to happen in the future. I I think this is just the tip of the iceberg. Right? I think, you know, I think Christianity is going to fizzle out on its own, but we're going to be able to help some people get out of it sooner before that happens. And yes, uh, it's going to benefit, going to benefit their lives. Now, my strategy is, uh, you know, we've made good progress on Facebook with, with uh, people, preterists, and even some futurists. It's a, uh, but I, I want to go for the top dogs on in Christianity. Now I've already made a challenge to Don Preston to uh, to have a team debate, and uh, I guess he chickened out, and that's understandable right. because he's got he's got a lot to lose, and if it gets out that that Iowa won again. That's not going to look good for for Don Preston, and it's not right. going to look look good for you know to a lot of people. He's got a lot of uh, a lot of fans, so you know I'm going after I'm going after other top dogs. I mean, you know, if if Don's not going to step up to the plate, then I'm going after others. So now there's no way that I'm going to have or be able to have a debate with notable Christian apologists like William Lane Craig. I mean, they're just a uh, they only debate academics, and I'm not an academic. Okay. But when I frequent Christian apologists' pages, pastors' paid discussion groups, and things like that, even if the pastors or the Christian apologists like William Lane Craig, even if they don't engage me with discussion, I'm still reaching their students. Right. And that's that's all I need to do because those are the people who are, who think that they need to go out and share the gospel. 
and um, and I'm there to tell them why they don't need to. So <laughs> my target audience um, are under those other church leaders. Now, have you ever got one of the church leaders uh, to engage you a little bit? Um, not once, no. Not once, okay. I see not you once. put out some stuff towards um, what is that guy's name? You won the Predators of the Week award for that. I forget his name, but he goes out on the street. He asks people if they broke the Ten Commandments. Ray Comfort. Oh yeah, yeah. He Do you remember uh, that? He, re- he replied, but it was more of a more of an evasion. He just kind of poo pooed it and encouraged me to buy his book and. <laughs> buy his book huh <laughs> it wasn't yeah. even a res- I wouldn't even classify it as a response he just but you know in that situation too I was you know people that people who follow him are going to see what I said to him and then they're going to engage me and that's what I want right Well, IO is definitely doing this thing. We've uh, got a couple of groups, Facebook groups out there, like you said, the Predators Collective, the Black Sheep Group. We got Jason Acosta making YouTube videos. It seems to, uh, you know, we have a, we're we're set up pretty good to reach out and to share this message with more people than in, uh, perhaps in the past. And I like that idea. Yeah, I think so too. I think uh, we're we're in a we're utilizing media very very well, and um, the written format that I use most of the time allows me to kind of fine tune these arguments. If I see a weakness in one, then I can edit it and kind of fine tune it. And uh, I'm always in the process of of doing that. I've got about 20 main arguments that I use for I/O. It's um, it's pretty unbeatable. Pretty unbeatable. I mean, I mean, if you're if you're honest, it's it's unbeatable. Yeah, that's the kind of stuff we need out there. Well, this this interview actually should be credited to Jeff Sales because he was like Ryan Michael Bradley should win the Predators of the Week award, and I said I was thinking the same thing. And then he said you should get him on your show, and I was like I'm thinking the same thing. So. <laughs> I told him I would reach out to you. So, Jeff Sales, if you're listening, this is for you, buddy. I got Michael Bradley on the show. Uh, thanks, Michael Bradley, for answering all of my questions and as well for explaining who this Satan was. That was really good and in-depth. I really enjoyed that part. Yeah, well, that's good for everybody, you know, including futurists and just your standard uh, Christian fundamentalist. Um, and, you know, some preterists may not, may not be aware of... Um, the significance of Satan in, in eschatology. So, um, yeah, it's it's interesting. I've got a lot of material on on that. In fact, I went through the entire Bible, every uh, every reference to Satan, and and did a study on it. And so, it's interesting stuff. And I think uh, a, another key point is that whoever Satan was, even if you don't want to accept that he was a person, but was some fallen angel, the Book of Revelation describes him being destroyed you know in the lake of fire and that book of course was a prophecy shortly to take place and then i believe it's romans chapter 11 that says you know the god of peace will shortly crush satan under your feet so whoever satan was he was defeated destroyed very shortly from the time those books was written so it's not possible to believe that shortly was actually referring to 2000 years later <laughs> i mean yep, words were right. their meaning at that time but thank you, Michael Bradley. Um, I will, if you, I mean, if you ever want to come on the show again, you're always welcome. It was a Thanks, blast bro. having you on. Appreciate it, bro. Any uh, closing remarks? Yeah, I hope all the uh, inconsistent preterists had a chance <laughs> to to hear this, and I look forward to your responses. And uh, be honest, guys. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, Michael Bradley. Have a great day. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks for having me on your show. Talk to you later. Yes, sir.